All right, everyone, welcome to episode 9-1. So in this uh, episode, we'll talk about the gluteal region, including the hip joint. Uh, so here on the first slide, of course, you can see the uh, hip uh, and the hip joint with the uh, femoral bone. Uh, what we'll notice is that during development, the os cocci, the hip bone itself, is actually composed of three different bones. The ilium, ischium, and pubis, pubis being the most anterior of those. Uh, so during development, those bone models form and then fuse uh, later on uh, in, in development. So some important aspects of the joints, of course, we always talk about the joint capsule and the ligaments that surround the joint. So the uh, ligaments, the joint capsule, and the hip joint is a little bit interesting in a number of ways. The first of these is that we have these, uh, this spiral organization of the ligaments uh, of the joint capsule. This uh, spiral uh, shape of the uh, ligaments is a result of uh, development and, and uh, forming that upright bipedal posture uh, in the uh, uh, uterine stage, in the uh, embryogenesis stage. It's also part of uh, the rotation of the uh, joints as they uh, come into the shape that they ultimately take. This spiral formation also facilitates our bipedal posture um, by creating a, a kind of passive uh, stability for our legs and can facilitate our upright running posture to reduce uh, energy in the contraction of the muscles during the uh, running phase. So that, those are ways in which that orientation facilitates that upright posture. So now we've cut through that joint capsule and we can see the fossa of the acetabulum where the head of the femur rests. So that fossa is surrounded by a bony ridge called the bony acetabulum. And that bony ridge is continued by uh, an encasing cartilage surrounding and on top of the bony acetabulum. Uh, so that ridge is called the acetabular labrum. And it's that labrum that holds the head of the femur in place to prevent uh, dislocation. Also another interesting structure within the joint is the uh, ligamentum uh, femoris capitis, or the ligament of the head of the femur. So this is a, a ligament within the joint capsule anchored on the inferior portion of the bony acetabulum, and it conveys the foveal artery to supply the head of the femur. So there's actually a small little artery within that ligament as well. Now we've taken a cross section through the hip so we can actually now see that bony acetabulum as it sticks out over the head of the femur as well as the labrum that continues as an extension of that bony acetabulum. Uh, another important structure we see here is the zona orbicularis, the, um, the orbiting fibers uh, around the neck of the femur. And those orbiting fibers uh, lock the neck and pull the head into the uh, acetabular fossa to again reinforce that joint. So this is a circumferential artery heading all the way around the neck of the femur. In this slide we can also begin to see uh, the uh, vascular supply of the neck of the femur. So the neck of the femur is actually supplied by these circumferential femoral arteries, uh, most commonly coming off of the deep femoral artery. So there is a lateral that goes anteriorly into the lateral side, and there is a medial going medially and posteriorly uh, to surround the neck of the femur and supply perforating branches that enter the joint capsule and enter the bone itself to supply the neck. But again, uh, the head of the femur is going to be supplied by a different artery, by the foveal artery. So here we get an idea of the branching pattern of all of those arteries. We can see the uh, external iliac artery traveling down as it passes behind the inguinal ligament, then it changes its name. At that point, it changes its name to the femoral artery. Now it is in the femoral triangle. Uh, shortly thereafter, it will branch to give off a deep uh, femoral artery. Uh, 
and the deep femoral artery will have a number of branches that supply the uh, posterior and medial compartments uh, of the thigh. Uh, primarily these perforating branches that we'll see are supplying the posterior compartment of the thigh. They perforate through adductor magnus. Uh, I mentioned this uh, in the last lecture about how uh, constant medial uh, compartment contraction of adductor magnus uh, can actually uh, close off these perforating branches so the posterior compartment doesn't get the oxygen supply it needs from the vasculature. But before those perforating arteries come off, what we'll likely see is the circumflex arteries branching off, one medially and one laterally from the deep femoral artery. There are a number of uh, variations uh, of arterial branching patterns, and we'll see that when we get into the dissection. One common variation is that the medial uh, circumflex femoral artery will be branching from the femoral artery itself instead of the deep uh, femoral. Sometimes both can be branching from the femoral instead of the deep. Uh, but the main point here is that arteries are named after the structure they supply, not their branching patterns. So branching patterns are not the uh, end-all and be-all of naming arteries. They might be a clue in most cases uh, in the terms of common branching patterns, but uh, in order to be uh, secure in the naming of an artery and knowing which artery is named uh, what name, you have to follow that artery to see what structure it supplies. So until you have dissected the entire course of an artery, uh, you're only guessing at the name. So, uh, sometimes that might be a good guess, sometimes that guess might be uh, good enough, uh, or the most common uh, branching pattern, but it's not going to be uh, a secure answer until you follow those branches. So here now we're getting into the vascular supply of the joint itself. I already mentioned the circumflex artery supplying the joint capsule and the neck of the femur. Here we see the foveal artery traveling through the, um, the uh, ligament of the head of the femur, uh, ligamentum femoris capitis. That foveal artery is a branch of a different artery, the obturator artery. Uh, which we'll learn more about uh, uh, and, uh, at a later time. An important concept is that the, uh, the hip joint requires a great deal of blood supply, and for that reason, these arteries in the posterior view of the hip form what's known as the cruciate anastomosis, or a joining of arteries in a cross shape. So on this slide, you can see the arteries that contribute to the cruciate anastomosis. The inferior gluteal artery uh, in, the, in the posterior deep gluteal region will travel inferiorly past the hip joint and anastomose with the lateral and uh, medial femoral circumflex arteries for a redundant supply. Furthermore, the first perforating branch coming off of the deep, uh, the deep femoral artery is going to send a small branch back up superiorly to join the uh, circumflex arteries. So in that way, if one of the circumflex arteries or even both of the circumflex arteries become impaired, there's redundant blood supply to this critical hip joint. That's because uh, mobility at the hip joint is critical for our functioning and survival. If we, can, if, if we have pain in our hip, from uh, osteoarthritic degeneration due to a lack of blood supply to the joint, then uh, you know we can't move, we can't run, we have constant pain. Uh, so this cruciate anastomosis is critical for avoiding that. However, the branch of the obturator artery that supplies the head, the foveal artery, that is only one single branch. And if that's occluded or damaged in any way, then the head of the femur no longer receives adequate blood supply and it starts to degenerate, uh, also called avascular necrosis of the head of the femur. When this happens, the only option is uh, surgical hip replacement. And so this is an example of that process here. This example is actually a total hip replacement. We can see we're replacing the uh, head of the femur uh, 
uh, and the neck of the femur with this uh, titanium or palladium shaft that goes down into the core of the femur inserted in that way. We can also see the acetabular fossa is being uh, replaced or augmented with these pieces here. So that requires a great deal of surgery. There are multiple approaches to uh, hip replacement surgeries and each type of surgery, each approach, whether it's anterior or lateral or posterior, is going to have its own risks associated with it. For instance, a, a lateral approach has the potential, the risk of damaging uh, some of the, um, the uh, nerves that supply the uh, tensor fascia lata. And so that might decrease lateral hip stability. Uh, the anterior approach is a uh, you know, deeper approach uh, and you'll have to travel through potentially the, um, the, uh, the uh, femoral triangle and potential dam potentially damage some of the, um, the branches of the femoral nerve, which supply the uh, dermatomes and myotomes of the anterior compartment of the thigh. So at any rate, uh, that's a whole nother discussion, but uh, this is the general process of that hip replacement. And so here we can see uh, some radiographic images I've included. This is a normal view of a, uh, or this is a uh, anterior posterior view of a normal hip joint, we can see that the, um, the gap between the acetabular uh, fossa and the head of the femur is uh, large and uniform throughout the entire acetabular uh, hip joint. But when we look instead at a damaged uh, hip joint, we can see that that gap is not uniform here. The femur is riding high uh, in the acetabular fossa, impacting the acetabular uh, uh, ridge on the superior portion. We can see the head of the femur is not a, a nice rounded shape, it's rough. And so this is the result of uh, wearing away of the acetabular labrum, uh, that, that uh, cartilaginous cushion in the hip joint over time. So here, this is a different view, a Laurenstein view of the hip joint. Uh, so this provides a good view of the head of the femur where that foveal artery uh, enters the head of the femur. Also a different view of the neck. Uh, and so this view provides additional information. So you might uh, occasionally see uh, that type of view. So now let's move into the actual gluteal musculature. Uh, so. I'm gonna uh, divide up the, the gluteal region into two different uh, muscular portions, a superficial and a deep portion of the gluteal region. The superficial portion is composed of glute max um, and medius, as well as tensor fascia lata. Glute maximus is supplied by the inferior gluteal nerve, whereas the other uh, muscles are supplied by the superior gluteal nerve. Uh, so this, uh, this group of muscles is mainly involved in the abduction of the hip. <clears throat> so we can see highlighting these different structures, uh, color-coded, and moving on now into the deep uh, structures of the hip. So here we can further subdivide this into abductors and adductors. And so uh, the nerve supply for each of these is going to be uh, fairly unique. The hip abductors, abductors, are supplied by uh, the superior gluteal nerve, uh, that's glute min, and piriformis is supplied by short branches coming directly off of S1 and S2. The hip adductors, or adductors, are supplied by L5 through S1. And you can go through this list. The muscles are uh, color-coded, uh, so you can identify them. When we're doing the dissections here, piriformis is going to be your primary landmark in this dissection of the deep gluteal region. So now you have a good neurovascular drawing of this region and what it looks like after reflecting the glute maximus. You can see uh, piriformis and why that's our landmark. Uh, below piriformis, sciatic nerve exits and begins traveling down the posterior thigh behind the hamstrings. Uh, so uh, that's going to be our orientation to help us in dissection.
Uh, so here's another view of that uh, same dissection, but with glute maximus uh, and minimus uh, both totally removed. So we can see now uh, glute minimus uh, supplied by the superior gluteal nerve and artery. So superior gluteal artery and nerve and inferior gluteal artery and nerve are named after which side of piriformis they exit from. So superior is coming out above piriformis. Inferior is coming out below piriformis and wrapping back around uh, to supply glute maximus. <clears throat> and of course, the sciatic nerve is traveling just below piriformis. Piriformis uh, has an interesting course in that it travels through the greater sciatic foramen. And uh, that creates a suprapuriform portion and an infrapuriform portion. So the structures that come out of the suprapuriform portion of the greater sciatic foramen are the superior gluteal artery uh, vein and nerve. Below, the, in the infrapuriform portion, you have the inferior gluteal artery vein and nerve as well as the uh, pudendal nerve with its internal pudendal artery and vein, sciatic nerve, and the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. In the lesser sciatic foramen, uh, the internal pudendal artery and vein and the pudendal nerve travel back around and re-enter in the lesser sciatic foramen, re-enter the uh, deeper portions in the gluteal region. Uh, so we'll see that uh, both in this gluteal portion and when we lecture uh, about the uh, perineum because it's the pudendal nerve that supplies the sensory sensation of the perineum. Uh, so an important uh, thing to be aware of is the location of these gluteal nerves, especially in relation to intragluteal injections or any procedure that occurs in the gluteal region. If the um, superior gluteal nerve is damaged, that will cause impairment to the, uh, the glute minimus and especially uh, tensor fascia lata, which can have uh, effects on gait. So an intragluteal injection uh, is always done superior to where that piriformis muscle uh, is located, superior to, to the suprapiriform portion of the greater sciatic foramen. And so uh, this slide shows you what can happen with damage to sup uh, the superior gluteal nerve. And uh, this condition is called the Trendelenburg sign. The Trendelenburg sign, we can see normal in the middle and a pathological case on the right. The Trendelenburg sign is when the hip rises on the planted foot. So during the walking phase, uh, when the foot is planted, that ipsilateral hip will rise as a result. So if we're walking and we plant our foot down on the, on the right-hand side on this slide, the right-hand portion of the hip will be elevated compared to the contralateral, the left-hand side. And that's because uh, glute minimus and tensor fascia lata, uh, their, in, their innervation has been impaired, meaning these muscles are weaker or they're not contracting at all meaning they cannot stabilize the hip during that walking phase. So in a related condition, uh, you might see the shifting of the center of gravity of their upper torso as a result. And so this entire walking pattern is called Duchenne's limp and uh, resulting from uh, insufficient uh, you know, gluteal innervation. Uh, so here we can see the patient will attempt to compensate by shifting their gravity over the planted foot. So their whole walk will be wobbling side to side uh, to varying degrees based on degree of severity of the injury. Now, next, let's talk about your favorite topic, which is plexuses. Uh, so we talked about the brachial plexus in the arm. There is, in fact, a plexus in the leg, a uh, lumbosacral plexus. So now we'll talk about that. But fortunately, the lumbosacral plexus is a lot simpler and a lot easier. It doesn't involve the um, resegregation of the divisions and the cords and trunks. So here we just have 
different uh, portions of the lumbar plexus and the sacral plexus coming together uh, to travel into the leg. So first off, this upper portion, T12 through L4, uh, that contains, that's going to end up being what's called the lumbar plexus. And the primary nerves of interest, uh, of motor nerves of interest coming off of that are femoral nerve and obturator nerve. There are a number of other uh, cutaneous nerves and uh, they have the uh, subcostal nerve also has a slight motor component for sure. Uh, and these uh, you'll also learn, uh, need to know, you'll need to understand the dermatome patterns of these nerves. Uh, we'll also see these nerves again when we do the posterior abdominal wall. When we actually do the visceral dissection, we'll physically see these nerves as well. Then we move down to the lumbosacral trunk, uh, which uh, provides or contributes to the uh, gluteal nerves, the superior and inferior. And finally, the sacral plexus below that, where we uh, develop the sciatic nerve and its eventual branches in the posterior thigh. So in this image, you get a three-dimensional-ish drawing of these nerves and the path they take. So be, be uh, cognizant of that. We can see the, uh, the uh, femoral nerve traveling into the anterior compartment. We can see the obturator nerve traveling through the obturator foramen into the medial compartment. And if you'll remember from the thigh lecture, obturator nerve innervates the anterior compartment, or uh, the femoral nerve innervates the uh, anterior compartment. Obturator nerve innervates the medial compartment. Uh, and then, of course, we see the branches of sciatic nerve heading posteriorly, uh, originating from the gluteal region. So understand uh, the innervation patterns of all of these nerves, the muscles they innervate, the actions of the muscles, and the segments uh, from which they arise. Here is one interpretation of the dermatome patterns, uh, just to supply that for you. Uh, and we can see uh, kind of mimics the, um, the dermatome patterns of the arm in, in ways where the, um, the, um, uh, the dermatomes travel down the length of the limb. At any rate, that's all for this time. Thanks for listening.